So, um, I'm Charles Kennedy, here in the physics department, and I'm going to talk to you very briefly uh, about our scale up classroom and then uh, throw in some other things about teaching that I've learned over the years. Here's a photo of the scale up classroom. It's in room 142 and 144 of the Oceanography and Physics Building. We built it in 2009. We've gotten a lot of support, help um, from Rusty and from Dwayne and from their crew. Uh, both in terms of resources, equipment, and also just the time that it takes to outfit and, and maintain uh, a room like this. The main uh, objective of having a room like this is interaction. So it's, a, it's what's called a studio format classroom. Uh, you can do flipped classroom type classes in there. You can do a lot of things in there. But the, the key is uh, to have interaction. And, and scale up itself is student-centered active learning environment for it was undergraduate physics and undergraduate programs. And I think it's something else now. Keeps evolving. It came out of Bob Beaver's group at uh, NC State, and there is what I call orthodox scale up. It's from the physics education research group where they have done a lot of studies uh, about what works, what doesn't work, and from a research standpoint. And they say do this, don't do this, do this, don't do that. We started out very orthodox, and then we tended to, with, especially with different faculty teaching it, uh, some people wanted to try some things, other people wanted to try other things, so we're not rigid. And we do like to try things, and that's one thing that I want to stress. I think it's really important when you're teaching not to be rigid. You're going to find some things work and some things don't work, and you should try new things, and, and don't be afraid to try new things. And if they don't work, then you know not to do it, and you know to tell people next time that, that didn't work. Uh, don't do it. The format of this class, you can see there are um, two screens on, on one side, there are another two screens on the other side. There are 10 tables in there that can accommodate up to nine students, so we can have 90 students total. They work in groups. Um, we try to limit the class actually to a little bit closer to 70. We find that works better than, than the 90, but depending on what the enrollment demand is, we never want to shut people out of a class. Um, so depending on the enrollment demand and, and available teachers and so forth, the uh, enrollment fluctuates. We always want to make sure that the class is available for students. Unfortunately, we have a, a you can see there's a pillar in the middle that's not by design, it's by necessity. That room was originally two rooms, that were, they were lab rooms. We started the scale up uh, classroom, which is four tables in one room, tore down the wall uh, so that we could expand it to have what you see there. That is a, there's a load-bearing pillar in the middle, which you don't even have to know physics to know it's not a good idea <laughs> to remove, so we left it there. Uh, the class itself is, is, is essentially a flipped classroom where the students are expected to do the reading beforehand, which they generally don't. Um, so it's true, and it's been very difficult to get them to do it. And we've tried various things like reading quizzes, and they will go into the one place in the book where the they have, to, they have to go to get the question, the answer to the reading quiz question. Um, and they're not really putting, in general, the effort that they need to, to, to prepare themselves for the class. They just do what the minimum they need to do for the reading quiz. So sometimes you do that, sometimes you don't. When I did it, I didn't think it was particularly effective. I felt it's a lot of time to grade the reading quizzes compared to what we're getting, the students were getting out of it. It probably wasn't worth it. I encourage them to do that, just like I encourage the students to do a lot of things, and sometimes they do and, and sometimes they don't. The students have to take charge of their own learning, and getting them to understand that is, is probably the most difficult thing as a teacher, that, that getting them to really appreciate that you know, there's a difference what they learn and what you teach is, is something that, that's different. Now, let me just talk very briefly about the dynamics. So the instructor might give what we call a mini lecture. So instead of having a 50 minute lecture or an hour and a half, whatever, where people will tune out after five minutes and they're gone. Um, we give a small lecture on the topic. They should have read the material ahead of time, may or may not have had a reading quiz. And then um, we will maybe give a clicker question to see if they understand it. You could have a quantitative answer or a qualitative answer. Clicker questions are actually very effective, we found. They're good because you get the it, it keeps the students engaged, but also you get instantaneous feedback. So, if you ask a question and the whole class gets it, then good, move on. They'll spend more time on it, they got it. If you get some, you know, everybody gets the wrong answer or it's random, then you know there's a problem and you need to spend more time on that. I find that very valuable, that, that instant feedback to the, to the faculty member, what do they know and what do they don't know? And then of course when they, when they 
don't know stuff, sometimes they learn the most from that because if you initiate a discussion, and that's where they really learn, um, you know, I got it wrong there, I see why I got it right. So we do that. The students then work in, in uh, groups on, on problems. And when we first started doing this, everybody was going to read ahead of time, and then we're just going to have this mini lecture and go at it, do the problem. No, oh, that didn't work so well. So we started saying, okay, we'll do some examples, as we would traditionally do in a lecture. Let's do an example, and then you guys do a problem, and that works a lot better. And then um, I made a switch up the last time I taught this class, just a couple years ago. I used to do a kind of an easy problem, and I said, okay, guys, now you do a harder problem. Well, they struggle with that. So I switched it around to what should be probably most people think totally trivial. I'm going to do the hard problem, and then you do essentially the same problem, except an easier version of the same problem. And they still struggle with that. So that was very telling. When you do you know, a, a physics problem where the charge is de uh, depends on the position, and then you do the same problem, except the charge is uniform, it's the same everywhere. Much easier problem mathematically. They still struggle. So that's an evolution. And it, it, uh, First, they just do the, you know, they just uh, do the problems with no examples, then they do it with an easy example, then they do it with a hard example, and then they do the easier one. I don't know what the next step is going to be, but we're always trying to think, what, what can we do to, to uh, improve? And, and certainly, I think doing the hard problem and having them do the easy problem as an example is something that's better than not even giving them an example. But you want the balance. Students think they learn by, what, by, by example, but in physics, that's largely not true. They learn by doing it and struggling and not understanding and then figuring it out on their own. So they do need some guidance. Can't just throw them out without guidance, but not just doing example after example after example. And I know this because I've done this, te this test where I'll do an example. How many of you understand what I just did? Everyone, of course they say, oh, yes, I understand. And they are answering honestly. They're not lying. They honestly believe it. So about 30 seconds have passed, and I give them the same problem. I just did on the board, right? Can, okay, do it. So they're not, they think they're learning, but they're not learning. So by making them do the problems in class, we're able to work with them, and it enhances their learning. And there is a lot of physical education research data that shows this. Uh, you can see, well, that looks like this picture is Larry Weinstein up there. But whoever's teaching it, usually there'll be the faculty member and then some TAs in there, they could be graduate TAs, or even we have some undergraduate, we have an undergraduate teaching fellow program, we hire a few of our more accomplished undergraduates, and they'll, uh, some of them get assigned to the scale classroom, they'll filter around and, and walk around and, and, and interact with the students who has a question. So that's sort of the, the format there. Um, it is great if the students were to do, again, some of this preparation that you need ahead of time for a flipped classroom. But we've had trouble getting to do it, I'll be honest. And I don't know what the solution is there. And I'm going to present a few things where I really don't know what the solution is. Um, and that's something else that you're going to be confronted with. You're going to try things that are not going to work. You can try best practices. They're not going to work very well. Um, and you just got to say, this isn't working. I need to do something else. Um, if it's working great, and if it's not, you need to sort of try to think outside the box. Um, we do have labs associated with this class, and that's something that's evolved also. In the original format, the labs were just intermixed, these short labs within the classroom. It's taking up too much time getting the lab stuff up and down, and there were some other problems too, because they were very different from our other types of labs. Then we just did labs on Friday, but because all the faculty always felt they didn't cover enough material, the labs were kind of getting pushed away so they could finish up the stuff we weren't able to finish at the beginning of the week. And then we separate out the labs. Now we have a little separate one-hour lab. And now we think that's too short. So probably the next evolution is going to be just combine all our semester one labs and semester two labs into two-hour labs. And we'll see how that works. It'll probably work better. It's almost full circle. But again, we're trying things. And some things work and some things don't. And we're not afraid to try things. And if they don't work, we're not afraid to say, that didn't work. And I think that's very important. Because you should not, not be afraid to say, we tried it. It didn't work. We're not going to do it. We're going to go on to um, we, they certainly learn a lot more in this format than they do in lecture format. And you can show numerically, we do give some assessment, numerical assessment, pre and post test for the class. And they look really good when you graph them and then, you know, lecture and, and scale up and all that. But here's the sad thing. The reason it looks so good is because they're not learning anything in lecture. It's sad, but it's true. If you look, we get them test sometimes they've gone backwards. Actually, it's really distressing to the faculty member when you, you do a pre-test and a post-test, 
and the class as a whole has gone down. Um, and in the lecture format, that, that can happen. They generally are not learning very much in lecture format. We think they're learning, but what assessment we're able to do shows they're just not learning that much. So you can get big improvements. Now, you could say, well, it's a threefold or fourfold improvement. Sounds very impressive. It's impressive because they're not learning that much in class, in the lecture class, but at least they're learning more in this type of interactive studio. And as it evolves, hopefully we'll be able to get those numbers up more and more and more, and they'll continue to learn. I know I want to keep us on track, so just mention a few other things. We have what's called a physics learning center. That's our help center, and it's staffed by volunteer faculty and um, graduate students who, as part of their stipend, might get assigned a couple hours in the, in the learning center. And again, some of our undergraduate teaching fellows that I pay will also staff the learning center. It's staffed maybe about 30, 33 hours a week. Uh, it's on the second floor of OCMPS. So people can just drop in and uh, get help whenever they want. It works very well. Uh, it's a real time saver for faculty because, uh, you know, if you, you'll find as a faculty member that students can, especially for a large class, there's going to be a large fraction that can't come to your office hours. They just have other things going on during their office hours. So they'll come at all times. And then you're put in a position where you either have to say, I can't help you, or, okay, I'll help you, but if you do that one-on-one, 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 that can be many, many hours during the week. And that's not, the, you know, you've got other things that you need to be doing. Uh, you, have other, you have other responsibilities. So by having a centralized help center, it, it really <coughs> helps, you know, if you put one hour in as a faculty member in the learning center, you will get a good return on that investment because that will save you many hours every week of students not coming one by one um, to your office. So that's what we do. We've done that for almost 20 years now, and um, that's a, been a big success. So for teaching a class like this, time management is critical because when you're doing problems and you have the students doing problems like this, it's easy to say, I'm going to spend 10 minutes, but they're not done, so you spend 20 minutes. And then before you know it, the class is over. And so you're always facing the challenge of, how much material, and, you know, how do I get through the material? Because you, you've got a certain amount of material that you need to cover, especially if it's a service class for another department. On the other hand, you want them to learn. And that's always a, an optimization, what you teach versus what they learn. We can all take a, a, a two-semester class and te teach it in one semester. You can go through the whole, the book that's meant for three semesters if you wanted to. You could probably teach it in one semester if you want to go that fast. And you know exactly what you're doing, but the students wouldn't know what you're doing. And so you would have taught a lot, and they would have learned nothing. So then you get to the one semester class where, you, where you're trying to get in the amount of material, but sometimes you're pushing it a little bit. And I will, if I think the class is not getting it, I will skip a chapter or slow down and say, we're just not going to get to that chapter. Because I'd rather that you learn 12 chapters and know it well than we cover 14 chapters and really don't know it very well. If you can learn 12 chapters well, you can go back and learn those other two when you need to. But that's a decision that um, you need to make. The other challenge that you're going to face is preparation of the students. In physics, the biggest problem we have is math preparation. I know that the test scores, uh, SATs and GPAs, and whatever the metrics are for high school, they look good. I, we hear that the numbers are rising at ODU. It's probably true. But the students that are coming in are not as well prepared to do the math as they once were. It's just true. I, I, I've seen this. I saw this when I was advisor. I see it when I'm teaching. And so now you find, you're faced with a situation where the students are coming to class. They technically met the prerequisites, but they're not ready for the class. So what do you do? Do you do some remedial work? If you don't really want to use that term. Do you go slower? Do you try to teach the material? That's a challenge that you have to face, and you have to balance it. And then the other the other issue that you're going to face is the certain, and some some other speakers today talked about it's kind of a life skills thing about you know being ready for college, what you need to do, what the, what expectations are on the student, not only the professor but on the student, and this idea that learning is work. I say to the students, you know you can't watch someone play basketball and then you're going to go out on the basketball court and be able to play basketball like that and play the sport that you want to play. You're not going to watch someone play the flute. And then you're going to pick up a flute, and you're going to be able to play the flute. Oh, yes, they, they agree with me there. <laughs> and then I say, so, but you're going to watch me do physics, and then you're going to be able to do the problem. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so they need to understand. They need to struggle. They need to not understand it before they understand it. 
Homework, just very briefly, we use a computer system, an online commercial system for submitting homework. Like most things, good and bad. It's good, the students get instant feedback. They can submit their answer on the computer, get feedback. If they need help, there's the learn they're in the learning center, there are computers, they can go get help right away while they're thinking about the problem. So that's great, and that's why we do it. The bad side, aside from the fact that bundling this with the textbook somehow causes such confusion at the bookstore, Every semester, that as chair, I spend about 110% of my time untangling bookstore orders. But that, that problem aside, um, the students cheat. And they actually will pay to cheat. So there's something called check. And they can go online, and they can pay, and almost every textbook problem that's ever been written, they can immediately get the answers and the solutions and all that. So we're facing more and more of a problem of this cheating going on. So the, you know, they have these great homework grades, and you give the exact same problem on a test, they have no idea how to do it. And so, um, our undergraduate committee is looking at that now. We may, you know, what are we gonna do? What's the, there's a benefit, of course, like everything, if the students use it legitimately, it's great. They're gonna get feedback, they get like five or six chances to submit their answer. From a learning perspective, it's wonderful, but there's a reality, and the reality is that most of the students just want the points, and they're willing to, Pay the cheat to get the points. And even if you say to them, so you've got 10 or 15 or 20% homework grade, it's really good, but now you can't do the tests. So 80% of your grade is not good. 80% F, 20% F. <laughs> that, but that goes back to math preparation. So, <laughs> so I don't know what's going to happen with that. There's another thing that I think the students are being heard on this question. Some of these are very obviously specific to physics, but you can translate them to your discipline. When I was in college, when we had to do homework, of course, we would write up the solutions and we'd hand them in and we'd get them back two weeks later. By then, we were on four topics ahead. We weren't thinking about those problems. So even if we did it wrong, it's like, yeah, I did it wrong, whatever. I don't have time to look at it. So this instantaneous feedback is good. But there's something to be said about writing out a solution in a way that the instructor understands it. And you'll understand it if you come back and look at it. It's like a lab book. You know, I tell my grad students, you should be able to come back 20 years from now fill up the lab book, you're not going to remember what you did in the lab that day. You read the lab book, you should be able to figure out what you did in, 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 in the lab that day. So I think that we're hurting the students, we're doing them a disservice by not making them write out the problems. In scale up, we will sometimes have them do a lab journal, a uh, homework journal rather, a homework journal, where they would have to hand it in and show that they are writing it out. But that's just an example, I think, where technology, the benefit of the instant feedback is there, but then we, we, we're losing something by not having them um, write it up. A few tips for teachers. Um, don't reinvent the wheel. So it's for beginning teachers, right? Uh, I have sent my lecture. First of all, if somebody is teaching this for the first time, we have different sets of lecture notes. We started with one, and then it kind of bifurcated, and as different faculty came. So now we have different sets of notes. We will give you, the, whoever is teaching, give you the notes. You don't have to reinvent the notes. They're there. That's not good use of your time. Uh, when I have postdocs or grad students get jobs at other colleges and universities, first thing I do is, well, no, it's the first thing, but one of the things I do is I offer them my notes. If, what class are you teaching? Okay, here are my notes. You're welcome to use them or not, but, you know, it may save you some time. So try not to reinvent the wheel. Students, um, they usually don't complain about difficulty, I found, actually. Very rarely do I get a complaint about difficulty, but fairness is what they complain about. And they have a right to, if you say the test is on chapters one through three, and then you give a problem from chapter four, that's not fair. And it isn't fair in that case, and you won't hear the end of that. And that's obviously not fair. Sometimes what you think is fair and what they think is fair may not be the same. But uh, be careful about fairness and perceived fairness. You'll usually get more negative feedback and trouble if they think they're not being treated fairly, and that could mean too much on a test, you know, too much material on a test or something as compared to that test was difficult, those problems were hard. You need to think like the students. This is one of the hardest things to do as a teacher. I'm sure I struggled in introductory physics when I was an undergrad, but I really don't remember struggling, to be honest. I'm sure I did, because everybody does. But I just don't remember sitting there thinking, I really have no idea how to solve this problem. I go up to the board and solve it right now, and it's totally trivial. I open up the book, and yeah, that's easy. I certainly didn't say that when I was a freshman in college, but I don't really remember that. So it's very easy for me to look at this, well, that's an easy problem. You know, someone asks me a problem, and my response is, well, that's easy. Well, 
It's easy to me because I've been doing it for a while. It's not easy to the students. You need to think like the students. You need to have that mindset of the experience that they have, what they, where they are in their career, and what they know, and think like that. When you think like that, if you're able to do it, then you go, oh yeah, I know why you're being confused because this, this, this. You already figured it, that this, this, this out, and you're able to move past it. But the students have it. Never assume they know something they should know. Never. I mean, it's it's usually a bad assumption. Like, well, you know this, you know this, you know this. No, and it may be because they just haven't taken it in a class or because they didn't learn it. But never say stuff like you should know this. Don't put the students down. That is, they will react very badly. Even sometimes joking, like, well, I you know I learned it in junior high school, so you know we do this in junior high. Why don't you should know? That can that can be perceived as a put down. And it's not any sort of put down, even if it's done as jest. Because um, I because I read evaluation you know, as chair, I have to read the I have to do I read the evaluations, the student opinion surveys, and then I go talk to the faculty. And, and I, for several faculty, students will they really they think they're being put down by the professor, who I think is mainly being sarcastic. But and when I talk to the professor, the professor just doesn't understand because. The, from his standpoint, he's not putting them down at all. Um, but that's how the students perceive it. So be careful about that. Um, and then just one other thing, it's not really even so much about teaching, but just being a faculty member. You have a CV. Update it every time you do anything. Okay, it's important that your CV is up to date. So, but you oftentimes don't update it until like once a year when you're asked for evaluations, and you will forget a lot of the things that you do. So if you're speaking at a workshop or attending a workshop, or um, reviewing a paper or a proposal, it doesn't matter what it is. Make it a habit. Anything that is eventually gonna, that belongs on your CV, immediately, even if it's just like, you know, uh, you're submitting a conference proceeding or something like that, even if you just put a bullet note that I need to put an entry here, uh, that's very important as a faculty member because your CV is just gonna continue to grow all the things you do. And you wanna get credit for all the stuff you do, and you're not gonna remember all the stuff you do. So always update your CV. So in short, uh, or in conclusion, it's, it's balancing everything, that's the key. This is an interactive studio format classroom, that's what scale is about, but all the teaching is about trying to balance all these problems that, that I mentioned. It's about evolution, what works, what doesn't work, and um, trying to uh, be open about what doesn't work and be honest and, and then try to, try to um, fix it. And then just to comment on some uh, comments that were made by previous speakers. I really like this idea about uh, the feedback. It really, is, it really is important. We don't do this for the introductory class, but when I'm teaching um, our intermediate level lab, the lab reports, I will take them and I will mark them up. I won't put a grade on them, but I'll mark them up as though I'm grading it. I don't put a grade, I don't record what I've done, and I just hand it back to the students. And then I say, now hand it in for a grade. And that is really very helpful, I found, um, in getting that what comes, if it can't, if the students take it seriously. Sometimes you get back to, you get back the same thing. They haven't made a change. I don't know what they expect, but, but, but the students who take it seriously and then make the changes, um, they benefit from that. And finally, this idea of common mistakes, that's a theme that you're gonna see a lot, particularly in the big classes. So on exams, as I'm grading the exam, I keep a separate clipboard with uh, notes of common mistakes, and after I return the exams, and we go over the correct solutions, then I go over the common mistakes that the class made, and that's very beneficial, I found, also. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Scale up classroom.